Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala Alhamdulillah We are now in episode 8 Of the podcast The Forward And we are inshallah today We are going to complete The second hadith The hadith of Jibreel Or the hadith of What is known as the hadith of Al-Islam with Iman with Ihsan So this is our part 3 And inshallah we will finish today and we will, Which means we will try to do this within uh, half an hour. So we're going to look at the rest of the commentary from uh, the two sheikhs, uh, Dr. Mustafa al Bagha and Muhyiddin Mistu in their shar called Al Wafi, uh, which is what you, we've, we've been relying upon in these lessons. So the two sheikhs continue and they explain what is Iman. So Iman is, in the language, it is tasdiq, it is affirmation. And in the revealed law, i.e. the legal definition, it is absolute, resolute affirmation of the, in, of the existence of Allah, the Creator, and that He, glorified, the glorified, is one and He has no partner. He is wahid la sharika la. And, and it is affirmation in the existence of Allah's creation as well. So we believe in the existence of Allah and we believe in the existence of Allah's creation, meaning that Allah has created, for example, the angels, and they are Allah's ennobled slaves, they do not disobey Allah and what they have commanded, and they do what they are told to do. Allah has created them from light, they do not eat, and they are not described as being male or female, and they do not procreate, and only Allah knows their number. So. There are a few things here to bear in mind, just as a side note. Now, the the angels being um, infallible in the sense that they do not disobey Allah, um, the proofs for this, you can find this in Surah Al-Nahl, in the 16th chapter, verses 49 and 50. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim bismillahir rahmanir rahim Allah says, "With the to whom la yastakbirun, you khafun rabbuhum, rabbuhum, min fuqihim, wa yifalun ma yu'marun." They fear their Lord from above, and they do as they are told, or they do as they are commanded. And the other verse is Surah Tahrim, the sixty-sixth chapter, verse six, where Allah says. That uh, it talks about the angels guarding over the fire. He says, They do not disobey Allah and what He has commanded them. They do what they are commanded to do. So, this is the state of the angels. They cannot disobey Allah. It's not in their nature to disobey Allah. Now, an interesting point that comes up here is the discussion of, and it's a difference of opinion we have, a major difference of opinion we have with the Christians, is uh, regarding Iblis, or the devil. Is he a fallen angel, or is he one of the jinn? Now, a good reference for this, where this argument is laid out very, very clearly, is uh, Sheikh Muhammad Ali al-Sabuni, in his Safat al-Tafasir, volume 1, page 45, because we, this is in the beginning of Surah al-Baqarah, where Allah talks about the creation of Adam and he said and this is ayah 34 where he says that we said to the angels to, to bow down to Adam for sajadu illa iblis they prostrated except for iblis aba wa stakbara wa kana min al-kafirin he refused he was arrogant and he was one of the disbelievers so uh, Sheikh Sabuni, what he does is he brings up this question. He says, was Iblis one of the angels? The answer is that the Mufassirun have differed into two positions. Some of them say that he's an angel, and their evidence is just is the istithna. Their evidence is the exception. Fasajadu illa Iblis. Right? The angels prostrate except for Iblis, and that would, that would indicate that he was one of them. But the others, they say, it is um, an istithna that is cut off. It doesn't mean that he's part of them. And, uh, again, if you look at the books of grammar, of the books of Arabic grammar, such as Shah uh, ibn Akhil on the Alfiya, um, this is discussed, how 
in the rules of grammar, when you use an exception, when you use a phrase, an exception, the thing that is that is accepted does not have to be the same as the group that is, is accepted from. The mustethna does not have to be of the same jins as the mustethna minhu. So, for example, you could say, you know, qawm al-qawm illa al-himar. You could say that, you know, the people stood up apart from the donkey. So if there's a donkey amongst a group of people, you could say, yeah, everyone stood up apart from the donkey. It doesn't mean that the donkey is a person, obviously. Okay. So, the... This is the dominant position. They say, Istithna is cut off. Iblis is from the jinn and not from the angels. And this is the position of Al-Hassan, Qaltada, and it's the chosen position of Zamakhshari and Hassan al-Basri. Uh, and Hassan al-Basri said, uh, Iblis was never an angel, not even for the blink of an eye, Torfat Ayn. And this position, this second position, is chosen because of uh, four evidences. There are four evidences for this. The first thing is what we've just mentioned, that the angels are transcendent above disobedience. They do not disobey Allah. They do not disobey Allah in what they've been commanded. This is Surah Tahrim, the 66th chapter, Ayah 6. And Iblis did what? He disobeyed the command of his Lord. He was commanded to bow down to Adam, and he refused. So this is the first proof. The second proof is that the angels are created from light and Iblis is created from fire. right? And therefore they have two different natures. The, the, the angels are created from Nur and Iblis is created from fire. And you can see this, for example, if you were to go to uh, Surat al-Araf in the seventh chapter, right at the beginning, the second page, I believe it is verse 12, uh, yes, verse 12, when Allah says, what prevented you from bowing down as I, uh, when I commanded, Iblis says, Ana khayrun minhu. I am better than him. Khalaqtani min nar. You created me from fire. Wa khalaqtuhum min teen. So it makes it very, very clear. He's created from fire. And as we know, the jinn are created from fire. The third proof is that the Malaika do not have offspring, as, as we just mentioned by the two sheikhs in their, in their shot of the hadith, and their com- commentary on the hadith. The angels do not have progeny, and Iblis has progeny. Again, Surah Al-Kaf, 50, they quote here, Do you take him and his progeny? Do you take his progeny as, as friends and protectors aside from me? This is Surah Al-Kaf, Ayah 50. And Surah Al-Kaf, Ayah 50 is a beautiful ayah because uh, in that same ayah, uh, that's what Sheikh Sabunin points out, he says, Al-Nas is sari al wadih The text is obvious and clear in Surah Al-Kaf that he is one of the jinn because Allah says, Alla Iblis kana min al-jinn. Right? Iblis was one of the jinn. He was from the jinn. Fafasaka an, 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 fafasaka an amri rabbihi. And he went against the command of his Lord. And that suffices as a proof that Iblis was not one of the angels. He was of the jinn. So I think that should put the matter to rest and with Allah's every success. The other thing to be mentioned, uh, Allah says um, regarding the number of the angels, uh, the proof for this, because because of the two shaykhs, they say, لا يعلم أدادهم إلا الله تعالى no one knows their number except for Allah the Exalted. If you go to Surah Al, uh, I believe it is Mudathir, um, Ayah 31. Uh, yes. Um, Right? And no one knows the soldiers of your Lord except for him. This is uh, what Allah says in Surah Al-Zumar, uh, sorry, Surah al the 74th chapter, verse 31. And, and so Mufassirun will say this refers to the angels. No one knows them except for your Lord, how many they are. Okay.
Then they continue. So the two sheikhs continue. We've talked about tastiq in the angels. The next thing is tastiq in the books. Tastiq bil kutub al-samawiyya al-munazzala. Affirming the, the, the divine books that have been sent down by Allah the Exalted and that they are Allah's legislation or His revealed law before they were corrupted at the hands of people and altered and changed. So when we say we believe in the Torah and we believe in the Injil or we believe in the Zabur and so forth, what we mean is we, re- we, we believe in them as Allah revealed them. They, were, they are Allah's speech, they are Allah's legislation, when He revealed them as they were when He revealed them. Not now in their current form when they are either lost or they are distorted or they are altered beyond recognition. That's not the case today. Uh, don't let anyone tell you that what uh, the Jews or Christians have is, is what Allah initially revealed, because that's simply not the case. The next thing is tasdiq, is affirmation of everything that, or, or, or affirmation of all the messengers that Allah chose to guide his creation, and whom, or, or upon whom he sent down the divine books, and to believe that the messengers are infallible men, or infallible human beings. Now, Again, a very, very important creed point, because there's a difference between the infallibility of the angels and the infallibil- infallibility of the prophets. The infallibility of the angels, the way we express this is we say, angels can't sin, prophets won't sin. I'll say that again. Angels cannot sin, Prophets will not sin, meaning for angels, it is simply not in their nature to sin. They're not created with the capacity to sin. Prophets are human beings. Prophets are human beings. Therefore, it is within them, they have the capacity within themselves to sin, but they don't because Allah protects them. And this is why Allah refers to prophets many times in the Quran as being mukhlas, not mukhlis. Mukhlas and mukhlis both mean uh, sincere, but mukhlis with a kesra is active. Mukhlas is passive. So mukhlas means to be made sincere. So I'll give you an example. Uh, Surah to Yusuf, the 12th chapter, verse 24, when he is tempted by the wife of the Aziz, Yusuf alayhi salam, Allah says about him, لَقَدْ حَمَّتْ بِهِ وَحَمَّ بِهَا Right? Meaning that, that, that she, she uh, inclined towards him, and he would have inclined towards her. He would have inclined towards here, except that he saw the burhan of his Lord. And then Allah says, "Inhu kana min ibadina al So Yusuf alayhi salam, he's a prophet. He's protected by Allah. He's protected by Allah from falling into sin. And this is the nature of all the prophets. Um, further proof. Further proof of this is if you look in Surah Al-Araf in the seventh chapter. One can look at the verses, I believe it is 61 and 67, where we have prophets like Nuh, and I believe it is Hud. Um, if I just check this out. Yes, so Nuh, first of all, he says in Ayah 61 of Surah Al-Araf, the seventh cha- chapter, he says, Ya qawmi laysa bi balalatum. He says, Oh my people, there's no dalala in me. And dalala, the word dalala is what they call in Arabic an ismul wahda. It means, means it's something, it's like something that happens once. So what he's saying, he's not saying there's no misguidance in me. What he really means to say, there isn't a speck of misguidance in me. There's nothing wrong with me. There's nothing wrong in me. There's no misguidance whatsoever. Similar expression we have below with uh, Hud alayhi salam. He says, he says, Oh my people, they say be safahatun. There's no foolishness or stupidity or idiocy inside me. These are all indications of um, the, infallibility of the, prof- the infallibility of the prophets and the fact that they are protected. They will not sin. Now, some people will retort and they will talk about Adam alayhi salam, for example, saying that he disobeyed his Lord and he, he, ate, he ate from the apple, uh, he, he ate from the tree. Um, let's, let's make that clear, he ate from the tree. Um, other people 
we'll also talk about verses where the Prophet Sallallahu is told to seek forgiveness for, for to seek forgiveness. For example, uh, uh, in Surah Al Muhammad, Ayah 19, the 47th chapter, Ayah 19. Uh, Allah says, "Fa'lam anhu la ilaha illallah wa astaghfir li dhanbik." Now, regarding the prophets, when prophets are told to seek forgiveness, what we have to bear in mind is that we again, if you look in the, in the tafsir literature, what they tell you is that the only sin of a prophet is tarq al ula, which, which, mean, which means that they leave that which is more praiseworthy for that which is less praiseworthy. They leave that which is better for that which is not as good. That's the only sin of the Prophet. There's nothing haram or uh, unlawful in what they do. Regarding Adam alayhi salam, and he disobeyed his Lord, the way the Mufassir would understand this, the Ulama have understood this throughout the ages, is that the command not to eat from the tree was a command of that was makru to disobey, not haram. Right? Because the only sin of it's haram. And, and, and if you look in the Qur'an, the word that Allah always uses, the verb that Allah always uses is the, is the verb nahiya, or, or that I anhakum, I, I forbid you from that tree. Now nahi, the, the verb, the verb nahi is not the same as to make something haram. The verb nahi in the Arabic language, or I should say in the, in the Sharia, when it's used, it can refer to something that is makru, and it can refer to something as haram. Because there's another hadith, I, I, the wording itself escapes me right now, but it refers to the Prophet ﷺ forbidding onions and garlic. And the verb nahi is used, that, that the base form of that verb is used. Now, onions and garlic are not haram. Absolutely, they're not haram, but they're makru, especially if you're going to eat them and then go to the masjid for pray, to, to, to pray, because your breath is going to stink and you're going to upset and disturb the other believers uh, in their prayer. So that's what we're getting at. Uh, there also is a fatwa by Muhammad Sayyid Ramadan al-Bolti on his, on his website, Nassim Hashem, where he explains this point. Because again, the word ma'asiyah, again, we have to look at words here. The Arabic language is a very, very rich language. We have to look at words. Words are beautiful and amazing. The word ma'asiyah, because when you, when you say that, you say someone, asani, someone has disobeyed me, there can be a legal meaning there that I, I gave them a command and they disobeyed me, but there's also a linguistic meaning there as well. For example, if someone asks you for advice and they don't follow your advice, you could say, you know, Al-Sanli, he, he, he disobeyed me in a sense. But it doesn't mean he did something haram, it doesn't mean he did something illegal or unlawful, it just means that you gave him advice, he didn't follow it. You gave him a suggestion or a recommendation, he didn't follow it up. So, this is a very important, important matter to make. But again, the position of the first two generations and, and the dominant position of Ahlul Sunnah Jama'ah is that angels are infallible, prophets are infallible. The difference is angels cannot sin, prophets will not sin because they're protected from Allah. And that's the position of Ahlul Sunnah Jama'ah and is the position of the first three generations. Okay. Um, the next thing is affirmation of the last day in which Allah will resurrect mankind from their graves and he will reckon them, he will take them to account for their actions and he will reward them for that which is good and, for, and with, with goodness. Whatever is good will be rewarded with goodness and whatever was evil will be rewarded with evil. There is also affirmation that everything that happens in this universe is by the taqdeer of Allah. It's by Allah's decree and his predestination and his will. And it is for a wisdom, everything that happens in this world, in this universe, is for a wisdom that he, the exalted, knows. These are the pillars of faith, and whoever believes in them, whoever believes in them is saved and is successful. Whoever believes in them is saved and is victorious. Uh, again, this goes back to all this hadith, man qala la ilallah, dakhil al-jannah. Whoever says la ilallah has entered paradise. And you can refer to a blog post I have below, called um, The Merit of La Ilallah. That hadith is there. I'll, I will put the link below, inshallah. And whoever uh, denies these pillars of Iman is misguided and has failed. This person will be of the losers in the next life. And Allah says in Surah Nisa, I 136, O you who believe, believe in Allah and His Messenger and the book that was sent down to His Messenger and the book that was sent down before. And whoever disbelieves in Allah and his messengers and his books 
sorry, sorry, whoever disbelieves in Allah and his angels and his books and his messengers and the last day, then he has gone astray, far, far astray. The next thing they mention is also the uh, Islam and Iman. Islam and Iman, what should be understood from what, it, what is preceded is that Islam and Iman are two distinct realities. They're two distinct realities. Islam is these five pillars of the Shahada, the prayer, the Zakat, the Ramadan, and Hajj. And then Iman is these six pillars of faith. So they are distinct from each other in terms of language and in terms of the revealed law. And this is the foundation of why they have different names. Now, but what happens is, is sometimes in the re, in the revealed law, one can be referred, one can be used to refer to the other. And when, when this happens, this is what's called tajawuz. This is this is just part of metaphor or, or figurative speech. Because in reality, there's no such thing as as iman without Islam, and there's no such thing as uh, Islam without iman, because they both they're mutually necessary they, they, necess they necessitate one another because one must have iman in the heart and then one must act upon it with the limbs now where this comes from again a distinction of this um, a basic premise here to understand is that when Islam and Iman are are seen together in a text when you see the word Islam and Iman together in a text like in an ayah or in this, this hadith for example then they have different meanings. Because, because they're together in the text, they have different meanings. Islam means this, Iman means this. When you see them alone, in isolation, they're synonymous. Or, or they're basically interchangeable. Because if you have an eye where Allah refers to believers, and he refers to mu'minun, or refers to those who believe, ladina amanu, it's the same thing. Because where this goes back to is in Surah Al-A'raf, in the 49th chapter, Verse 14, Allah mentions the Bedouins, the Arab, and they say, Amenna. They say, We believe. And the Master of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is told, He's commanded to say to them, La Lem tu'minu. You have not believed, but you just say you have submitted. Say, Islamna, because Iman has not entered your hearts yet. So, so some people talk about this as level. They say, they say that someone might be. A believer, someone says, someone says the shahada, they've entered Islam, but iman has not settled into their heart yet. They still, might, they might have doubts and so forth, and and, and, and these kind of issues, and, and or they have they have certain um, you know, what we call shubahat that need to be reconciled before iman becomes totally settled in their hearts. Uh, and this is why there is a zakat category, whether for right? those whose heart needs need to be reconciled, um, people who've just entered the faith, or or maybe they had some. Uh, they had some niggling doubts that they didn't, re that they didn't uh, reconcile with. But the point here is that if someone comes into, the, comes into Islam, we assume that they are a Muslim, they are a Muslim and a Mu'min at the same time. We don't make this distinction. So if Allah says, for example, in Surah Al-Baqarah, O you who believe, Al-Adina Amin, O you who believe, Qutiba alaykum as siyam O you who believe, Fasting is prescribed for you. Someone can't turn around and say, well, I'm just a Muslim. I'm not really a mu'min yet because I just became Muslim recently. No, it's, it's the same thing. You're a Muslim, you're a mu'min. Allah's command you to fast, you fast. Every every ayah in the every ayah in the Quran in which Allah says, oh, you who believe, he, he means you. You are included in that address. And now I realize that um, we are about 24 minutes into this uh, podcast, this episode. And therefore, I think I will stop there, and I will have to do part four in this hadith. There's still another page of commentary to go over, and I really, really do not want to uh, rush things. I think it's very important that every hadith and every commentary, every word of commentary is given its uh, haq, is given its right. So I will stop there, inshallah, and I will do a part four as soon as I am able to. And with Allah, Allah is ever success. Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh.